Deep learning for us is not another project. It is a change in the culture. The future is here. It's crowding the present. We better engage students in the present to change the present. Uh, thanks, uh, it's good to be back here again with you. And I, I wanted to, uh, I'll talk for about a half an hour. We've got more than that. We can explore different issues. But I did want to set the uh, tone of this and the framework of it. Uh, I'm based in Toronto, as probably you know. And we have, uh, we have about 10 people that are the core of our work. So, and then we partner with CEC and other people in California and around the country. The way I would describe the work is that we focus on three things. I talk generically and then specifically about the actual work. Uh, we always focus on three things. One is big chunks of the system. So that uh, this is uh, that we don't, um, a minimum size is more than one district, is the way I would put it. Not one district, but more than one. Uh, the uh, bigger size is the state, although I never tackle Illinois these days but California, bigger and more complex, Ontario and other places. So systemness, I'm gonna call that, chunks of the system. The second thing is we always zero in on pedagogy. What is the, uh, what is the best possible teaching and learning experiences for students and for teachers to thrive, uh, not just individually, but especially collectively. And the third is we always trace the causal pathway of, uh, from pedagogy to measurable student learning outcomes. Not to please the accountability system, but to know what you're doing. If you don't know that, you don't know what you're doing. So uh, and we have little, uh, I call them sticky phrases or variations. I might drop a half a dozen of them, but these are insights. And I'll say that, I'll name one of them now, but in a moment, insights are what we get from working with um, implementation with you. So I always say it this way, because it's exactly true, uh, is that we, 80% of our best ideas come from leading practitioners, not from other researchers. Our best ideas are coming this way, and that's why they're more relevant, that's why I can talk with in different language. So I don't hang around researchers unless they're doing the work, and then they're part of our team or whatever. So it's, what, it's, what, it's teaming up to do this three things, uh, uh, for we do it for a while and then after we do it I write a book about it after not before and then we do it better the next time and then I write a better book so you can see it's practice chasing theory uh, practice is the basis of it uh, and Kurt, Kurt Lewin said it there's nothing so practical as good theory we would say there's nothing so theoretical as good practice it really is based when it works so insights we get are uh, things like uh, we need to strive for greater specificity or precision in the work, but precision does not mean prescription. Prescription is when you blow it by imposing it. Precision is when you get at the specifics of what works. And once you get that, a lot of people do the uptake. You don't have to impose it. And if you impose it, it's not a good change idea, usually a good change process. So I'll, I'll say some of that, that work. And so the 10 people that I mix and match, most of them, all of them have come from doing it. In one sense, I've come from doing it. Uh, I've been an advisor to the Premier and the Minister of Ontario since 2003. So we took a stuck system in 2004, really, we started. And for the last 13 years, I've uh, steadily improved the capacity of the system. 5,000 schools, 2 million students. We have a similar population to yours in uh, Ontario, I, I don't know, 13. Uh, 13 million people. We have 72 districts. You have 800. So there's a difference in terms of local uh, uh, initiative or lack therein. But uh, we have uh, definitely um, been able to to work uh, with this in a in a good, effective way. So th that's me. Um, Joanne Quinn, my co uh, co-author for Coherence book that I'll just display in a few minutes. Uh, Joanne has been uh, worked her way up from principal to teacher principal, superintendent, and then uh, joined me uh, actually 20 years ago. We started to do more system work together with school districts and beyond that. Uh, Mary Jean Gallagher is a good example of uh, how I staff, I guess I'll say, in the last uh, five uh, years in particular. Uh, we, um, Mary Jean was superintendent of the uh, district 
in, uh, in uh, the Windsor area, so across the river from Detroit, and not exactly Windsor, but just adjacent to that. So she was a great superintendent, one of the 72, uh, 72 in Ontario. And about seven years ago, we recruited her to head the Learning Secretariat, which is something that we set up as part of the apparatus for the Ministry of Education to work with school districts to improve literacy, numeracy, high school graduation, capacity building. So she came in, um, I, I would say we hired her because I'm part of the advisor of the government, so we're looking for how to do the changes. And came in and we, I worked with her for the six years that she was there, and she retired last year, and then I hired her on my staff. So she becomes somebody who's not only done it as a district superintendent, highly successful district in a tough area, but she actually ran the province, and so knows that. So when we do system work now, with system leaders, she's the one that works with me. So we're doing that in California. She is just coming back from, uh, in the next couple of days, from Melbourne, Australia, where we're working with the state of Victoria on this, working back with, a, uh, with um, Ontario as well. So we have a lot of things like that. I won't go on to the whole list, but another person I'd like to uh, mention it, who works, is, turns out to be fantastic. His name is Santiago Rincon Gallardo. Uh, uh, born in Mexico, but he did his doctorate in Harvard with Richard Elmore. Uh, graduated uh, four years ago. Met his wife, who was from Toronto at Harvard. Came back to Toronto in about, I'd say, half an hour after he landed, I hired him as my chief researcher. <laughs> so he's been unbelievably good. He's, about, he's just turned 40, so he's a young scholar on the way up. But he's really well grounded. Uh, knows, uh, uh, did his research on uh, networks of uh, of improvement uh, and uh, comparative study, but has uh, done incredible stuff with us just in the three years he's been with us. So we have a lot of people, you met, some of you met Mag uh, Gardner last week. Uh, one of the things we started to do in our deep learning work, which I'll get to later, is that because it's organized in a way that we work with clusters of schools in different countries, and each cluster has a cluster leader, one or more depending on how many, uh, that those cluster leaders are the local people that lead the project and we support them. And then it's turned out as we found these certain cluster leaders that are great and want to change, they've come to work with us, uh, not as cluster leaders, but as people on our team that work in turn with the cluster leaders back in. So Meg was from, uh, was a superintendent, an area superintendent in Hamilton, Ontario. And then now in the last year and from for forever, I'm gonna say, is gonna work with us as a uh, cl cluster, uh, as a leader who can uh, go back and support the schools and these intermediaries that are working on this. So we've got a lot of uh, combinations of work like that. Uh, the uh, other thing, the other way I would express it is that we're not interested in this project. And I'm going to present it in a way by the coherence making and then on top of that, the MPDL. That's how we'll talk in the next uh, 20 minutes. Uh, this project is uh, for people not to implement our project, but to people who want to exploit us to go in a direction that they already want to go in. That's how we view it. Uh, we have uh, frames, we have enabling tools and all of that. None of them are prescriptive, they're <coughs> enabling. And they're, they're meant to, uh, uh, you can have, you can be interested in deep learning but not know where to start. We know how to help you where to start and learn together and to do it. So. It, it really is a uh, joint development where you should be uh, wanting, if you do come to work with us and with CEC, to do things that you're able to do with us that you're not able to do on your own. And it's your agenda that way. Uh, the second way I would put it is that because we're interested in system change, uh, we're interested in a lot of different parts of the world in terms of education systems getting better. And I won't name the ones we're working on other than to say, uh, when I think of the US, I'm not so arrogant to think we can change the U.S. Uh, in much in education in big terms, but I do think we can relate to states, individual states, where there's enough interest at either the middle, which I'll come back to, and or the top uh, to uh, work to end up uh, improving the education system. So that uh, this is not just another project with a few districts for me. This is a foot in the door to say how do you uh, transform for the better your context and your media context. And I'll give you um, one kind of concept for it that we'll come back to, but 
I'll give you also a concrete example. Uh, California, as we started to interact with them about six years ago, and I, I, I normally am spending, you know, uh, I know 150 days a year in, in, in this country anyway, so it's kind of seamless back and forth. Uh, but some of them are uh, the big projects like this one. And as we did our work uh, in the last, over the last eight years in California, uh, more and more people at different levels got interested in what they saw as the Ontario solution, for want of a better word, uh, where we took the system and uh, were able to work in a way that transformed the public education system uh, into something that's much better and be bigger capacity building. So, and I, um, I'm going to show, uh, I may get to this now, this, I'm going to show the right drivers here. This handout you can get from my um, website. The website is michaelfullen.ca. When I'm in California, I say it's bilingual, CA for Canada, CA for California. <laughs> so, uh, uh, but this is, uh, uh, this 2011, I did this uh, paper policy paper, Choosing the Wrong Drivers for Whole System Reform. Uh, you can get it on the website, but it basically said a driver is a policy, a wrong driver is a policy that doesn't work. Uh, why do politicians use policies that don't work? I think because they can, because they're in a hurry. They can legislate the wrong drivers. They can made to be appeal uh, superficially to the public. It's not as much work to pass a legislature for a wrong driver. It is to do the right driver in practice. Uh, so there's a lot of reasons why they might do it, but it doesn't work. So uh, I said, it's not that we don't use the drivers on the right side. We don't use them to put them in the driver's seat. So wrong-headed accountability backfires. It's a demotivator. Uh, the second one, more subtle individualistic uh, solutions. I'll call it the individual, individualistic fallacy. It kind of says if you get better teachers and better individual teachers, better individual leaders, individual, 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 what we would call human capital, you will get good changes. Well, it turns out the culture of the system eats up good individuals faster than you can produce them. So we co-equally work on the culture of the system as well as the individual. And that's, that combination is really what counts. So, uh, so we'll, we'll, in the course of doing this, uh, one of the things that um, people said to us, they said, we love the, right, uh, the wrong drivers analysis. We like that paper. California said that. They said, we're going to change to our version of the right drivers. Can you help us? And we said, yes, we will do that. So they said, in order to do that, uh, you can't just talk about the wrong drivers. You have to flesh out the right drivers. So I'll show you the model. What we did is create a solution that was built around the wrong driver, the right drivers. It's not literally the four, although it's essentially those four. And then, um, and then approached it to uh, bring about the implementation. So we're working in a big way now in California with lots of districts and cultures. And uh, uh, if, I, if I had to give you the two ways of expressing the work, sometimes they connect, sometimes you can think of them separately. It's coherence making and new pedagogies for deep learning. Those are the two labels that I want to pursue. Uh, so when you get, go to my website, uh, just go to uh, resources. You can download this. You can download the paper uh, under the category of articles. So the coherence framework is this. Uh, there's a book on it. And uh, we got most of our insights from doing workshops in California, actually. Did a whole bunch of them for two, year, two to three years, still do. And we, we, Joanne and I, as we did these workshops, we tried to, all the time, uh, another kind of sticky phrase we have is simplexity. Doesn't sound like a sticky phrase, but simplexity is you take a complex problem and you boil it down to the smallest number of key things. That's the simple part. Uh, usually around four, five, six, in this case, four. Uh, and that those smallest number, they have to be comprehensive, that is, cover the waterfront. They have to be uh, succinct, not like a list of 12 things. And they have to be comprehensive. Uh, and, well, not comprehensive, they have to be mutually exclusive so that they don't overlap and aren't confusing. So we said, this seems to kind of be that. We took the right drivers. And we said, yeah, we've got capacity building on, under collaboration. We've got pedagogy under deepening learning. Uh, we need to sharpen uh, the focusing direction. Uh, we, we criticized accountability on the white, one hand, but we said, you've got to have accountability. You can't say uh, the wrong driver accountability is wrong. Yes, you can say that. But then you can't say no accountability is the answer. You have to say, what's the version of accountability? So I'll, 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 uh, we have uh, built it in as a natural under securing accountability. 
This is, I guess I would say now that this is kind of the me best metaphor is the, the heart. Four quadrants of the heart. Uh, when heart. Healthy heart is when the blood is flowing within the quadrants and across. If any one of the quadrants is damaged, you're ill or worse. Same with an organization. And that's why the original connection with CEC, where we said the pedagogy part, which is deep learning, it's not, not your strong suit. And if in order for this to work, your strong suit is collaboration and focus of direction, uh, probably accountability, but definitely you've got to build up. So we talked about the four of those needing to work. Uh, they're not in sequence. It's not one, two, three, four, but they're approximately the first two we t like to lead with. That is, we like to lead with sorting out the direction and doing it through collaborative interaction. And I'll, I'll, I'll give you just a, a flavor. Uh, what we're going to do is give you a flavor of each of the four, and then I'm going to dwell on the de deepening learning, which is one of the four, so we can uh, put it into practice. Uh, coherence, this is, it's important to identify the, the definition of coherence by saying coherence is not alignment only. Alignment, you can put, do that on paper. You can describe alignment in a vision paper. Uh, the way to think about coherence, and then you'll know how to get it and how not to get it, is that it's fully and only subjective. It doesn't exist if it's not in your mind. So that means the task of shared coherence is to make it in all the critical players in their minds in a way that when they articulate it separately, if we did, you know, take five of them and put them in different <coughs> rooms and say, tell us about the vision in your district, tell us about how you're uh, going about it, what progress are you making, uh, what remains to be done, what are the, uh, what are the, uh, what's the uh, evidence of success, we would get in a district that has its act together, we'd get consistency and clarity and specificity. If it didn't, we would get vague generalities or inconsistencies. So the, the, the criteria, uh, criterion for success is the ability to talk the walk. Not in superficial terms, but in specific terms. And you can see right away, you can't get that degree of uh, coherence through a workshop or through a great document or through a great speech. You can only get it one way, and this is by interacting over a period of time, focusing, focusing, getting better and better at it. So what I want to say about this work, and this is very important to put it this way, this is not a, what we have is not a program or a project. It is a change in the culture. That's one thing to say. And the other thing to say is it's not a change in the culture of the school only. It's a change in the culture of the district. So if I'm thinking of you in this room, I'm saying the proposition is how do you change the culture of the district? which is what the district does, what the schools does, what's the relationship vertically, and, and, uh, and what's the relationship uh, laterally across schools, and does it w end up being cohesive. So that's um, the part of uh, this. I'll touch base a little bit. We, don't, we could spend a whole day, obviously, doing this, as we sometimes do. The focusing direction is a tricky one because it looks like all you have to do is get moral purpose right. And, uh, the right in way you know there's a problem because every district in the country has a strategic plan that contains moral purpose. But every district in the country is not successful. So obviously it's not the answer. It's only a partial answer. And if we go to this, you'll notice that we have two things in there. One is to sharpen the um, district, uh, I mean the vision, but it's also to get the strategy started in the left-hand quadrant, not later. You can't Another way of saying this is moral purpose is not a strategy, right? Moral purpose by itself is not a strategy. So what do I mean by that? I'm not gonna ask you to do this, but you can see in this, um, these four questions we would do in a, in a workshop um, that they really uh, talk to people about what is your moral purpose? What are you doing about it? How, what progress are you being made and so forth? And what you uh, often see then is you don't get in a clear account unless a district is working interactively the way I'm going to present it. And the w one way of uh, putting it this way is uh, if I were to ask teachers in your district or teachers anywhere, uh, can all students learn? 95% of them would say yes, I think, I would predict. But if you're in a school <laughs> where all kids are not learning, I doubt if deep down you believe that all kids can learn, because they're not. How could you possibly believe it? It's not that you would be lying, it's just that you would psychologically never come to the point of saying all kids won't, uh, won't learn. 
And then, so our question from a change point of view is what's going to change your mind? Uh, what's going to change your mind that all kids can learn? And I'll tell you two things that won't change your mind and one thing that will. The two that won't change your mind, one is research evidence. Here's your school and here are other schools just like yours, right? They're just like yours, they're very similar. Uh, and, they're, and they're same resources, same demographics, and it's successful. So I'll tell you a second why that doesn't work so well. The second thing that won't work is increased moral exhortation. What that means is you say, we're in this for the learning of the kids, only you say it louder and more often. That's an exhortation. And so that can be stir the passions to a certain extent. But the reason that those two things don't work is the first one says it can be done. The second one says it should be done. Neither of them tell you how to do it. So you're stuck with frustration or denial. Then what's going to make it work, and this is the answer in a way, is that you give students, teachers like that, new experiences in relatively non-threatening circumstances, new experiences, non-threatening, with, with some help from peers or other leaders uh, that give them the experience where they start to get different responses from their, from their students then they start to have an inkling of believing that this is working. And then after that, they see some of it happen. It's the experiential success that changes their minds because it's not only experiential, it's concrete. It actually works. They know it works because they're being part of it. So we want to make sure we don't take superficial assumptions on the focusing direction. And um, in this, uh, I want to take this point. Uh, the clarity of strategy is part of quadrant one. You'll see this definition of a change strategy has two pieces in it. A, cha a successful change strategy shapes and reshapes the idea. So it's a good idea, but it's not static. And it builds capacity and ownership. Capacity is skills. So uh, what does that mean? I'll give you um, a really interesting example that fleshes out the process. We were working in ACT, Australia Capital Territory, a few years ago. Uh, 80 schools, stagnant district. Uh, they wanted to make some changes. We helped them do it. Uh, so the first year we were there, we were in the high school, Canberra Secondary School, and they had introduced a peer coaching supervision and feedback model. They trained three teachers in that. And most of the teachers that day said to us at the beginning, and we weren't there to study that particular innovation, but it happened to be timing. Uh, they said to us, uh, we're not gonna do this. Uh, we don't want other teachers coming into our room, observing us and giving us feedback, telling us how to teach. So I, I'm going to call it massive resistance because it was widespread, no, almost no exception. Three years later, we came back and everybody was engaged in the, in the peer coaching feedback, all of them. Uh, same people, a few people left, but essentially the same crowd. So here we got massive resistance, massive embracing. What happened? I sat down with the deputy principal at the end of the day. And I said, this is amazing from a change point of view, and I want to ask you a killer change question. The killer change question is this, is participation in this peer coaching feedback supervision model, is it voluntary or mandatory for teachers? And he didn't hesitate a nanosecond. He said, it's voluntary but inevitable. That's a, a successful change process. When people reject something at the beginning, they don't know what they're rejecting. They don't know what they don't know. If you mandate it, you definitely blow it. But what did they do? They said, yeah, we, like, we want you to do it, but we're not, it's, it's voluntary. Secondly, we'd like a few people to try it and report back, see what it's like. Uh, thirdly, if you do participate anytime, you never have to take the feedback. All we want you to do is participate in it, interact with it. So they made it easier for people to try it out, less threatening, uh, but nonetheless expectations, kind of a pull, push and pull uh, process. And then it started to work and people built on it uh, so that you really get that sense that this is a process. It's about all of the change. A more succinct version of this that captures the same point. The CEO of Honeywell, a few years ago, he retired, successful leader. Uh, he was interviewed and they asked him, what's the most important thing you've learned about change leadership in your tenure? And he said, the most important thing is to be right at the end of the meeting, not at the beginning of the meeting. Right? That's, a, that's, a, that's a metaphor, that if you're right at the beginning of the meeting, you're right in your own mind only. If you're right at the end of the meeting, the process, you process it literally with the group, and that's what Canberra did to get it. So, so this uh, focusing direction is not a matter of getting the right direction. It's a matter of interacting in a way that people buy into it, 
and, and uh, you know, like the direction. So uh, collaborative cultures, there's a lot of things we can say about this. Uh, this is what CEC represents and what we have uh, found is, uh, I think I'll probably skip the video. There's a lot of videos on our uh, website that show this, four minute videos. And the thing to, about collaboration, and this again, a question on precision. If, uh, if I were with a group of teachers and I thought they should collaborate more, I would never give them the theoretical research argument as to why collaboration is a good idea. Why? Because it's not convincing. I say collaboration is good, and they say, well, wait a minute, how, how do I know it's good? Won't, won't people be uh, kind of influencing on my, you know, my territory? Uh, uh, will it work? It won't, will I be wasting my time? All of those things. So what you have to do is you have to convince people on specific grounds. And we have been working recently, Andy Hargraves and myself together and separately, to show what kind of collaboration is effective. So we, we start with the notion that collaboration is not automatically a good thing. You can collaborate to do nothing. You can collaborate to do the wrong thing. When is collaboration a good thing? When it leads to specific changes in the nature of pedagogy, new changes that actually work. And so that the specificity, again, comes into play, the interaction of it. And another thing we have uncovered here, I think, um, you have to decide how much to co cover here. Another thing I want to say right now is we have sorted out, I think successfully, uh, the, the, the relationship between autonomy and collaboration. There's a long argument about teachers, sometimes teachers in the unions would say, we want autonomy, if you only leave us alone to teach the way we're supposed to, we, everything would be all right. And then the others would say, well, we don't want to, because if we leave you alone, it won't happen enough. So we've got to have collaboration. Then it comes forced collaboration. And then you get superficial PLCs because people are supposed to do that, et cetera. So with the reality of, the, of this is to understand that autonomy is not isolation. There's a word for isolation. It's called isolation. <laughs> autonomy is when you can think on your own. And what could be better, and this is how we, we say eventually, autonomy and collaboration, and this is not mutually exclusive, this is combined. If I collaborate and then I'm autonomous, I'm better autonomously because I've learned from the collaboration. If I'm good autonomously and I collaborate, I have something to contribute. So our work here is a mutual feed between autonomy and collaboration. I'm not gonna, sh uh, I did a book on the principle. Uh, there's a number of things about uh, discoveries as to what school principals do to uh, be effective. I'll only give you the punchline. The punchline is that the principals who are effective are not instructional leaders in the sense of striving to be the best pedagogue in the building. They are lead learners who know enough about instruction to enable it and they cause instruction to, uh, to uh, get improvement through teachers, uh, through teachers indirectly to learning but nonetheless explicitly. So that the notion is that the, the actual finding is that principals who participate as learners with teachers are moving the school forward. Guess what, if they participate as learners, they actually learn a little bit. If they don't participate as learners, all they are managers. And so that this is, uh, that this powerful impact of the principal now is to cause the teachers to get better, not individually only, but together. So another sticky phrase, if you want to change the group, use the group to change the group. So um, this, this de role description, while learning alongside them, that's the key thing for principal. I'm not going to show you this video, but you can look at it on the website. Uh, you can go Park Manor, you can go K3 Peters, which is in uh, Los Angeles, uh, south of there. It's all the same as the principals who are, get there and they figure out how to relate to the group in order to change the nature of the work, build collaboration, and build collaboration that lasts beyond the tenure of the given principal because the collaborative group carries on after the principal leaves. The group that's not collaborative, there's nothing to carry on. So another key thing you can uh, want to know, I guess I'll say, is our book on our work on capital. Uh, I've already said that human capital is a wrong driver because it's individuals trying to change the culture. Social capital is when the group gets together and changes the, literally, the specific culture of the organization, so that's focused. And then the one we and others have added lately 
and this is another weak suit of the teaching profession, is the teaching profession historically has not been very good at uh, using evidence of performance and data and et cetera. Now the problem is there's too much evidence dumped on teachers so that they're overwhelmed with data. Uh, but nonetheless, what's the skill needed here? The skill needed, and I would put it this way, is assessment literacy. Assessment literacy, not literacy assessment. Assessment literacy means you are skilled at figuring out the use of data, the nature of data, and that decisional capital is none other than the ability of teachers uh, in small groups, usually and individually, and otherwise, to sort out how well are we doing. It's the measurable pathway that I t talked about earlier. Uh, this I've already said, autonomy is not isolation. Connected autonomy is another word for our favorite new word concept, which is collaborative professionalism. Collaborative professionalism is the concept that we use now. Uh, this Thursday, if you're interested in this work, Andy Hargraves is going to tweet uh, the release of his report on collaborative professionalism that really does a great job of sorting it out. And if you're interested in the topic, that's the single best place I would start. Conditions for success, a certain amount of trust and non-judgmentalism, transparency, specificity again. These combinations interact in a favorable way. Intrinsic motivators, this is what makes it work. This is Dan Pink's list mapped onto ours. Sense of purpose is our moral purpose. Mastery is our capacity. If you get better at something, you want to do more of it. Connected, a degree of autonomy, you can't be hemmed in too much. And then the one we've used that he hasn't used so much is we call it connectedness, but it again is back to collaboration. These are intrinsic motivators, which means they come natural to humans. And I'm saying about the last one, it's natural for humans to cooperate built into our evolutionary genes unless something goes wrong in, in, uh, in your circumstances after you're born. So we are then tapping into the na natural intrinsic motivators, which have been mostly, uh, I wouldn't say eradicated, but they, mo they certainly have been diminished. If I take for just teachers, a thousand teachers, their intrinsic motivators, since they came into the profession, have been damaged because they have been, haven't had experiences that allows their intrinsic motivators to flourish. And that's what our kind of new work does. So um, coherence framework, now we're going to get to deep learning. And I want to get now shift into the new pedagogies for deep learning. Uh, and I, I probably will stop there and not go to securing accountability. But here's, here's the, uh, the issue. Uh, the deep learning for us is not another project, although some systems that have taken it on have treated it as the latest project. It is actually a transformation in the culture. And what it does is it changes the learning outcomes. It changes three things. It changes the learning outcomes, which uh, in our case you'll see them, the six C's, more fundamental competencies to be successful. And it changes them in a way that's not incompatible with the basic things like literacy and numeracy, in fact, can enhance those. So changes the learning outcomes. It radically changes the nature of teaching. Um, so that we're talking about, that's why we call it transformation. And it implicates the whole system, the school, the district, and uh, hopefully sometimes the state. And I want to go back to the leadership from the middle to say that this, uh, that this movement that I'm talking about is part and parcel. If I take Illinois, your best bet for success in Illinois is not to hope that the state will get its act together. That is definitely not your best bet. Uh, and your, your best bet is not to say, I have to figure this out by myself. Your best bet is to team up and leverage the middle. That is your school as part of a district, and that is your district as part of other districts at the middle, becoming more powerful. Politically, becoming more powerful educationally. And by strengthening the middle, you have a chance of being influential, I'm going to say, in the system. Uh, but even if you don't, it's a better middle than you have now. So I, to take, uh, this is the, uh, we have now just finished our book. It's in the printers. It's coming out December 1st. Uh, it, uh, you can see by the title. And we have some discoveries, I guess I'll say. Not that we have them in our model specifically beforehand. But the subtitle, Engage the World, Change the World. This has been fantastic because now the students are learning. The way to think about 
is, uh, remember I said we changed the purpose of learning. Uh, now students are not thinking and the teachers are not thinking, we better prepare students for the future. We're not doing that. The future is here. It's crowding the present. We better engage students in the present to change the present. Right? That's the, that's the notion. That's what this stuff does. And so uh, when we look at, um, I had some things on uh, integrating technology and change. Pedagogy is what we're talking about, the deep learning. Technology is the drive for that. And change is the, uh, is the, the knowledge about how to bring about change, which is more sophisticated than just being right. Uh, so do I have this one? Yeah. I want to just show you a 30 second clip here. Uh, this is, uh, remember technology was a wrong driver. So I just want to show you something here to prove that I haven't gone over to the other side to embrace technology, but we do put it in its place. So I just want to make sure the sound is okay here. So 30 seconds worth. Emma. Emma. Not Emma. Every day it's getting all my Emma. Oh, I'm Emma. Emma. So I hope you got both lessons there. One is <laughs> technology can't do everything. And the other one is that uh, judgmentalism do, is not a motivator. <laughs> Unless you want revenge. And then, <laughs> then you get it heavily. So now I want to get into the deep learning. Although it's that one qua quadrant of the uh, four, it really is part of the coherence framework. The deep learning is about focusing directions, about collaboration, about securing accountability. And this, what we, when we started this, we said, here's the solution has to be able to achieve this. It has to be irresistibly engaging for uh, teachers as well as students. It's got to be elegantly efficient. This to me is the Steve Jobs criterion, which is put the, uh, put the uh, energy into the design of the technology so that ease of use is furthered. It's got to be technologically ubiquitous in a, in a learning way. So this is another way of saying this is you get twice the learning for the same price. The learning day later gets bigger, longer. Uh, it's got to be steeped in real life problem solving, but not as PBL only. PBL is a project, it's not a culture. Uh, you have to define this as a change in the culture uh, that, uh, that I mentioned. And uh, we added in involved deep learning because irresistibly engaging can happen without deep learning. So uh, what is deep learning? Learning that connects to passion, that's team related. Learning that sticks, I'll come back to that, it's really the punchline. Learning that has human significance, not just abstract stuff. And learning that involves higher order cognitive processes. So the way to think about deep learning is quality learning that sticks. So that's the simple definition. Quality learning that sticks with you. Uh, so that um, these characteristics are actually elements of things that stick. And, uh, and, and that they feed into it. And that's what our, uh, our tools, so to speak, are based on. Uh, here's the kind of the map of the world. We're involved in these uh, seven countries. There's about 1,200 schools now. And we have, uh, I would say in the US, uh, the, and this is really why we're talking today, we have a growing, certainly, commitment in California about coherence. Uh, and uh, and in some, with turn with your your work also with deep learning and some other aspects, uh, we have uh, also uh, possibly uh, there's a, a elaboration in Washington, Washington State in terms of uh, districts. We have a county in Michigan of 29 schools that are involved, and one of the reasons we're very interested in your work is the combination of being able to use the turn union management focus, which does produce good results in the areas across the country that you're working, California, Oregon, uh, Illinois for, for, for certain. But I have a bigger interest in Illinois, which is to improve Illinois, right? You yeah, you, you do do. Uh, and, and you're, the, and you're the, you know, the level to do that. So the, uh, when I, I said the outcomes change, 
Uh, these are the six outcomes we have, the six C's they're called. You'll recognize four of them are typically referred to as the 21st century skills. The 21st century skills, that is the four other than character and citizenship, have been around for at least 21 years. And they've gone nowhere because they're too abstract. You can find them in the common core. The common core, which we find compatible, is not, doesn't have enough oomph to it. Who wants to parse paragraphs? Uh, and and wh you know, where, is the, where is the kind of grabbing for deep learning in this? And uh, what happens when, and we have rubrics for each of these to guide them, uh, but I would say that character education and, and uh, citizenship have turned out to be very catalytic. Students gravitate towards citizenship ideas. They gravitate even towards a, a character which is really self-determination. Self and then the, the neglected one, the poor cousin of the original four C's, it, as you know, is creativity. And creativity thrives in this. So now you've got creativity, citizenship, and character education. They're catalytic. You can't do any one of those without them ramifying to the other ones. And so we don't, uh, we don't recommend people jump tomorrow into all six C's. Where are you? Where do you start? You know, ramification. Secondly, we would uh, also explicitly, and we're doing this, show how this uh, deep learning six C's improves the basics of literacy and numeracy, just to take those two. They, they improve also uh, dropout rates, uh, high school graduation. So that, when I said it changes the outcomes, I mean these. When it changes teaching, I mean this. We have, uh, these are our four pillars of learning, if you like. Uh, just do all four. We tried to, again, say, if you had learning that was really great, what would it encompass? And uh, it encompasses all four of these. If you miss one of these, it's weak. It encompasses learning pedagogical practices, which are things that are engaging for students, collaborative inquiry, uh, the, the, you know, some of the aspects of good learning that's been around. It encompasses a new one, I think, that we've made more explicit, learning partnerships, which is essentially uh, students, uh, new partnerships between and among students, teachers, and families. So that kind of stimulates, the, that engages the family in it. Learning environments, very important to be able to uh, uh, change the learning environment. You know, the traditional learning environment actually is changing in a lot of schools, but it's still limited and you have to there's ideas of how to do that. And then leveraging digital, now we come back to technology, but it's in the service of the, the whole business here instead of something that you add on. Uh, I was just yesterday in, um, working with the, uh, in, in a conference in relation to the study, uh, or the Mooresville, uh, which is in North Carolina, and the superintendent and I wrote a book called Unstoppable Momentum about Mooresville. Uh, they didn't do deep learning, but they certainly did learning that was uh, technology and pedagogically based. And the superintendent, who's now left there, his name is Mark Edwards, uh, he, uh, and he used our ideas without us, which is good. It shows that the ideas tra can travel on their own. And what he did was he was a great proponent of one-to-one -on -one conversion, digital conversion. Every student should have a computer. And halfway through implementing that, he discovered in his own that it wasn't the one-to-one -one solution, it was the change in the culture of the district that mattered. So he shifted his priority, still had one-to-one, -one, but he shifted the priority into building leadership that could uh, uh, help others lead, all the specificity, everything that's in the book that we wrote, and it made a huge difference. They are the, uh, there's 115 districts in North Carolina. Mooresville is uh, 110th in terms of per pupil expenditure, and it is fifth in performance of high school graduation and uh, literacy and math. Fifth of 115, low, almost, almost the lowest amount of money available. <coughs> so this is culture. So I want you, just before I close here, uh, just to see at least one version of this. Uh, it's a four minute video. And I'd like you just to do one thing. Uh, it's from Australia, it's an elementary school. They're one of the 80 schools we work with in Victoria. And the question I want you to do is just identify an adjective that descri describes, captures your gut reaction. One word that captures your gut reaction. Uh, if you want to use two words, hyphenate. <laughs> hyphenate it. So just, uh, just like spontaneous reaction. Rana. The 
Enigma mission came from the students' ideas. They wanted to be able to capture something that was slightly mysterious, something that grabbed your attention. I'm out going about my business and I'm going to find the answers. An Enigma mission is a project based on deep thinking and uh, basically you have to choose a topic and you have to research very, very deep on it and the more deep the better. Welcome to the Enigma portal. Your task as a member of an Enigma mission is to explain the great paradoxes conundrums and mysteries of our existence. An Enigma mission is kind of like a passion project and something that the teachers will help challenge us to expand our knowledge of what happens around the world and what's in the real world out there. I chose um, autism as my topic because I have a relative that is autistic and at first I didn't know anything about autism and I was very interested in the topic. I chose to do my Enigma mission based on the thiocene, also known as the Tasmanian tiger. Miss Vine, our teacher, she said she would pick a few students to do this project about bone integration. And so we took up that challenge and we tried to do that. But uh, the main challenge for me was um, DNA, I was like so interested, I mean, learning from DNA, DNA is an enigma mission in itself. I mean, it's not a question, it's a whole enigma mission. I interviewed people and tried to find out their understanding of autism and I contacted a scientist. I had to research about the animal and the process of bringing it back to life. I also contacted a paleontologist named Michael Archer. Him and a group are um, trying to bring animals back to life. I'm not going to grow up to be a doctor, but I am going to grow up to be a computer engineer. So I don't know how genes can link with that, but with my genes, I could like produce some sort of new like software or something. We want them to be thinkers. We want them to be people who can create change, people who can make a difference. This has changed my idea for what I want to be when I grow up. And also, I want to try and say to the world that not everyone's the same, pretty much. It's just because they have like different body parts and stuff like that. It doesn't mean they're any different from us. I think it's given me a whole new um, look of autism. And I think it's um, shown me a lot um, of what it's about. And I think I would like to be working on autism in the future and trying to help people with autism. So let me just round it off a little bit about, I mentioned the emerging discoveries. These were things that were not in our formulation, but we were open to seeing what happens. We found that helping humanity was a huge natural theme for students. A 10-year-old girl in Uruguay, one of our uh, seven countries, she said, I'm supposed to help humanity, so I think I'll start with my own neighborhood. And what they developed was a robot, uh, uh, a device, uh, that uh, mechanical device that scared birds away who were eating the vegetables in the home and the gar community gardens. Uh, just like a simple, like almost solution. But she's saying, that's, a, that's what I'm doing. So the helping humanity comes natural. Uh, life and learning merge. I mean, John Dewey said this more than 100 years ago. Uh, uh, education is not preparation for life, it's life itself. It's never before been more clear. Uh, these uh, C's are catalytic. Uh, even citizenship, people, uh, students almost say to us, I think I, I probably have said it in this word, words, uh, don't prepare me to be a citizen 10 years from now. The world needs me now. I want to be a citizen of tomorrow today. This is urgent. And so there's a kind of good focus urgency. Student as change agent and some really interesting clips. I won't show you, uh, these are grade one school, I'm thinking of six-year-olds who, because of the school, went deep learning and they did these things. Uh, uh, one morning, the principal walked into the school, into his office, and on his desk was an iPad with a sticky note that said, play me. So he played it, and it was his grade one students. These are six and seven-year-olds, literally with this language saying, we have some ideas about how to change our learning environment. 
so we'll be more focused and work together more effectively and learn better. Could we meet with you? This is a, like, it wouldn't happen if they weren't invited, if there wasn't the kind of atmosphere, if they weren't working on those issues. But there's no, we haven't found the lower age limit of a student who could be a change agent. The equity hypothesis, which is I wanted to end with in some ways, it's, uh, do I want to do that? Yeah, the equity hypothesis, I think it's in the next two or three slides, is this, you'll see it on this slide, is deep learning is good for all students. It's especially good for those students who are most disconnected from regular schooling. Because a student disconnected from regular schooling, which they found irrelevant or boring or they're not good at it, now feels they belong when they're part of a purpose project, a passion project, where they're doing something with their hands, which is deep learning, where they're, they're kind of more valued, where they thrive. I mean, this is, again, an emerging discovery because in some ways, when we first started this, some people assumed, we didn't take a stand on it, they assumed that deep learning was for the most advanced students because they're already learning, they're, let's take this healing off it. But it turned out that deep learning was the best for those students who are most disconnected. And this is fantastic. We've got, in our book, we've got, I don't know, 40 or 50 vignettes, one page vignettes of students who were t really out of it, who became totally immersed in their learning, where the teachers give us the portrayal of what that looked like and what it does. So that's big. Uh, I wanted to touch base on accountability. Uh, we went back to Richard Elmore who got it right, but he didn't flesh it out enough uh, 12 years ago or so, where he said no amount of uh, external accountability in the state level will be effective in the absence of internal accountability. Internal accountability is when you're accountable to yourself. And once we've opened up uh, this where you have transparency, you have specificity, you have the kind of really goals. What people have then become, they've become assessment literate, which is a phrase I used uh, earlier. They've become empowered in terms of their ability to assess things. And because this is compatible, and I would say this is about everything in the world now, everything's transparent. So what you're doing and what you're accomplishing is transparent even if you try to hide it. So the best is we call it uh, move towards the danger. Uh, the best is you better get used to transparency, but now try to use it uh, for your own terms. And that's what internal accountability does itself and external accountability. If you do it, you uh, can manage most external accountability demands. Uh, so this, I, I want to give you a list of, uh, uh, this is the inequity one. If you want to, uh, if you want to improve equity, attack inequity with excellence. Uh, our tweet is this, don't dumb down, smarten up, right? And then I think I have the last slide I want. Yeah, so these are some of the conditions which I think internal accountability thrives, that these conditions uh, support it, I guess I'll say, the combination of it. There's about eight of them. You know, they're all in the same domain, but they reinforce internal accountability. And uh, not, not one of them is, is uh, imp more important than the other. Uh, driven by a clear moral purpose, you're more likely, if that kind of gets exemplified by teachers and it's out in the open and it's operational, you're more likely to want accountability. Transparency, obvious, access, uh, nature of practice and nature of outcomes. Specificity and evidence, this is really critical. It's hard not to be accountable if, uh, if evidence and, and specificity is there. Non-judgmentalism, a big one for us. It's, your, it's an accountability, the problem has not been just the measures, it's been the attitude, the mindset you take to the measures, which is if it's punitive, it turns people off. If it's constructive, it's a whole different. But causal pathways I mentioned. You go outside to get better inside, this is another one of our sticky phrases. Whether I'm a teacher or a school or a district, if I go outside, I'm going outside to get better inside. Yes, I contribute outside, but it's a selfish, a motive for us. You go outside in order to get better inside. And that's very much the case. Co-responsibility, do I have one more here? Yeah, trust. Trust is an interesting one. Everybody agrees that trust is key. But of course, how do you get trust if you don't have it? And you certainly don't get it by leaders saying, please trust me. <laughs> yeah, they have to prove it. And our rule of thumb is name it, model it, and monitor it. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you.